Good morning, Arcade Church. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to our Sunday morning service. We are so glad that you have joined us this morning for our online service. We hope that you're staying healthy and safe during this shelter in place. We do miss seeing you. We miss worshiping the Lord together with you, but we love to see your participation here. Also, if you're a guest for the very first time this morning, we'd love to say hello to you in a more personal way. I'd like to get to know you. And that can be accomplished by texting us, text Arcade Guest to 484848, or you can go to arcadechurch.com. Right there on the homepage, there's a place where you can fill out the guest uh, information. And we just love to get to know you. While you're on the website, take a look around, get to know us a little bit. Our purpose at Arcade Church is to get as many people as possible to see, hear, and follow Jesus. And that website, We'll give you a lot of information as to how we do that. Also, if you have questions, you can email us at info at arcadechurch.com. We also want you to know that the staff is still praying for you. Arcade is a praying church, and we are still engaged with our members, wanting to know what it is and how we can pray for you. Letting us know your prayer requests or your praises, that would be great. And you can do that by texting Arcade Prayer to 484848, or you can visit arcadechurch.com forward slash prayer. Stand to your feet. Let's get ready to worship with our families and our living rooms, wherever you are this morning. Worship our good God, who is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. Through every battle,
When darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I hold When brokenness and pain is all I know Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken Cause my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Now shame no longer has a place to hide. of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving oh God you're so
Over the past couple weeks, we've been highlighting some of our Arcadians who've been loving their neighbors and showing God's love. This week, we get to visit with Carol Biggs, who's been busy doing something very cool. Let's take a look. 
Hi, my name's Carol Biggs and I am a member of RK Church. I've um, participated in making masks. I've been doing some for my coworkers at the hospital where I work. I've um, sewn some masks for other local healthcare facilities. I've sewn some for friends and I've also had the opportunity to sew some masks for um, the USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier. Even though it seemed like a small thing to me to sew some masks, I realized that it was something that God had prepared for me to do when I had the opportunity to learn to sew years ago. And it was something that he just uh, allowed for me to do in this unusual time and I could do right here from my home during this shelter in place time. So I just like to encourage each of you to think about the abilities that God has given you and how you might be able to do a small thing to help someone else with that. Thank you, Carol, for loving your neighbor in such a tangible way. Something we might consider small can mean the world to someone else. If you or someone you know has been loving their neighbor, please let us know. Info at rkchurch.com. Have you been joining us at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. with Pastor Craig? This has been a really wonderful time to get together virtually to practice some good spiritual disciplines that we can use in our everyday lives. So, what has God been teaching you through this? We'd love for you to let us know in the comments. Have you visited our RK Kids webpage recently? If you go to rkchurch.com kids, you'll find the weekly Bible story video, activity pages, YouTube channels, worship playlists, we even have my favorite, Sermon Bingo. So you can follow along with Pastor Craig and play bingo this morning. We have some of our own Sunday school teachers that will be reading Bible stories you'll find under the story time button. There's new stuff every week, so check it out and let us know what you think. If you're a middle schooler or a high schooler, we'd love to connect with you on Zoom today right after service. You can find the ID for that over on our Instagram accounts. For high school, it's RKHS Group. From middle school, it's AC Second Story. Good to see y'all. As you can see, even though we are not meeting in person, there are still so many ways that we are ministering to our community and we need your help to continue to do so. Giving to Arcade is a way for our members and our regular attenders to continue worshiping our great God. There are four easy ways to give to Arcade. First, you can go to our website, at arcadechurch.com slash give. You can go and download our app and click on the Give tab. You can text the word Arcade Give, all one word, to 484848. Or you can mail a check or cash to our street address at 3927 Marconi Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95821. We are so grateful for the many people that have continued giving through this time. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the people in this church, the people in this community. Thank you for the many people who are watching today. Please bless them. Please bless this time that we have together. Thank you for ministering to us. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Arcade family and anyone else that's joining us online with Facebook Live or YouTube. We're really glad that you're with us. And uh, no doubt you have already been blessed by a lot of the gifted artists that we have here at Arcade Church. And I'm very grateful that they have led us in our living room, uh, in our family room, in our kitchens, in the glory of Christ. I really appreciate their giftedness. Hey, if you have your Bibles, would you go ahead and take them? And turn to Acts chapter 1, the book of Acts. It's the fifth book of the New Testament. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And uh, I want to read some scripture. And we're going to focus on that a little bit this morning. And hopefully walk away with some, some pertinent application. Right. So Acts chapter 1. And we're going to begin reading at verse 6. Acts 1 verse 6. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? This is the time after Jesus had risen from the dead. And uh, Luke kind of begins his book in this way. 
Jesus says to them, verse 7, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the stability, the security, the clarity that it brings. We have much to learn from this text this morning, Lord, and so I pray that we are allowed to do that by your glory and by your grace. In the holy name of Christ, amen. Well, the, the, the series title of this sermon series is Abide, and admittedly, that's not really a term or a word that we use a lot around here. We don't use the word abide to describe anything. It's, it's, it's a Christian word. It's a Bible word. And I'm okay with that. I think that we should have our own words that apply to Scripture. But in case you're looking for a kind of a definition, I've got one here on the screen. Abide, it means obey, observe, follow, keep to, hold to, conform to, stick to, defer to. Pick your poison. Pick whatever definition you want because it all fits. And what this is, what we're talking about here is, is this. Every one of us that is watching this, we are all abiders. Every one of us. There is something or someone in our life that we obey, observe, follow, keep to, hold to, conform to, stick to, defer to. There is something or someone in our life that we abide in, that we abide with. And so the issue is, during these times of crises that we are currently in, that stuff tends to bubble to the surface. It tends to come to the surface what we truly abide in. We can say every Sunday of the year that we abide in Jesus, that we abide in Christ. We can say that, but then during times like this that we are currently in, it would be very easy for us to see that what we really abide in is this, or this, or this, but it's not Jesus. I, I wrestle with that myself. And, and so what we're doing in this Abide series is just talking about Jesus. Because that's what the Bible tells us to do. If you join me in the mornings at 7 a.m., and if you're not, I'd love to have you join me on Facebook Live or Instagram Live. We're memorizing John chapter 15, verses 1 through 17 together. And it's a tough memory work, but the word Abide comes over and over and over again in that text. Because that's what we are to do. And so it seems to me that if we're going to talk about abide, that we should talk about Jesus because that's what we're called to abide in. And so what we started back last fall is just covering the life of Jesus and the major events. And let's face it, we've got some major events in the life of Jesus. For example, we've got these significant holidays that are surrounding the life of Jesus and three significant events at Christmas time. It's all about Jesus' birth. On Good Friday, it's all about Jesus' death. On Easter Sunday, it's all about Jesus' resurrection. And we rehearse those in American culture. Those are the three big days. But here's what happens. There are other events in the life of Christ that are just as vital, just as important as these events. And they are Jesus' ascension and Jesus' return. What about those? What, what about Jesus' ascension? What about Jesus' return? So we want to talk about those in this Abide series and how significant those truths are during this time of pandemic. Let's take, first of all, the ascension of Jesus and cover that. Uh, this, is, this is huge for us. Pick, picture this. You're a member of a demolition team. And your job is to blow a hole through a mountain so a train could go through. Your, your job is to make a tunnel. And so you get all the necessary dynamite and explosives and you, and you get your crew to strategically put the dynamite in places where the most 
explosive power can happen. The most granite can blow away. So you can build this tunnel. And so you spend several days making sure that the dynamite is placed in just the right place and the day comes for the blast. And so you, you, you pull back out of the blast radius and you get your crew and you make sure everybody is safe and you, because you're the foreman, you give the countdown for, for the blast. Five, four, three, two, one. Nothing. Five, four, three, two, one. Nothing. You look at your crew and says, what, what's going on? Why didn't, why didn't you detonate the, the dynamite? And the crew goes, what detonator? We didn't bring a detonator. The dynamite is rendered useless unless it's detonated. I, I would say this. The birth, the death, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the dynamite. The ascension is the detonator. And we're going to talk more about that next week when we talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. But understand, this is how vital the ascension is. And this is kind of one of the forgotten things about the Bible, primarily because this is the event where Jesus kind of disappears. But it's because of this event that you and I have been given power of the Holy Spirit. He says, and I read it in the scripture reading in in verse 8 of chapter 1, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This doesn't happen unless Jesus leaves physically. And so this morning, before we get into this, I just want to talk about the ascension. There's all kinds of artwork and I really enjoy artwork. I'm not really an art snob or aficionado. I just like I like pretty pictures. And and the art world has represented the ascension of Jesus Christ very, very well. I want to show you three portraits. Here's the first one. And this is probably the one that we would think of. I, I I can remember, I think I had a picture Bible when I was a child, and this was very similar to the picture that was in that. And so this would be the traditional Jesus ascending to the Father. And so it's well, it's very well done. My favorite is this one, though. This is my favorite picture where these two people, these two men are talking to the apostles and they're just, they're just looking up. I mean, can you imagine, I, in my mind's eye, I'm thinking of these disciples and they're seeing Jesus float up and I got to believe that somewhere along the way, one of them in Hebrew or Aramaic said, dude, they have seen so many things. They've seen him walk on water. They've seen him calm storms. They've seen him raise the dead. They see them feed thousands of people with very little food. They see miracle after miracle after miracle. They did not see this coming. And I, that's why I like this picture here, because Jesus is absent. He's not even there, but these disciples are looking up. I, I, that, this is my favorite. And then this one, this, just, <laughs> this is the, the feet only Jesus. Uh, this one just strikes me funny. Uh, this, this goes back about 600 years. <laughs> it's just, just the feet of Jesus, and you see the scars and the disciples and their surprised look. Um, I, I, I like that. That's just to give you a little bit of artwork. I think it's always fun to see those kinds of things. Before we get into the application, though, I do want to talk about some of the things that are referred to in the passage. Uh, first of all, the post-resurrection Jesus spent 40 days on the earth. He spent 40 days on the earth. And that's a couple of questions. Why, why the 40 days? What was the significance? Why didn't on Easter Sunday, Jesus rise from the dead? Why didn't he just beam up right then? Why, didn't, why, did, why did he wait almost a month and a half? Well, the text shows us that this is why. The first reason is because he wanted to give many proofs of the resurrection. We didn't read this passage in the scripture reading, but it says this in chapter 1, verse 3. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days. He knew that it was impossible for them to actually contemplate the reality of the resurrection. It was just so hard to sink in. And so for those, that month and a half, all the, almost that month and a half, he is appearing and reappearing to them to prove to them that he really is physically alive, that he has defeated both sin and death. And so that was one of the reasons. But then another reason that we're given in the text that we didn't read for scripture reading is he wanted to teach them about the kingdom of God. There was more for them to learn. And it says here again in chapter 1, verse 3, and speaking about the kingdom of God. 
what the, the idea of the kingdom of God in the disciples' mind and what the reality of the kingdom of God was in Jesus' mind were two different things. Even after three, three and a half years of hearing Jesus preach about the kingdom of God, it still didn't sink in. I, I really rest in that because there's a lot of things about Jesus that still don't sink in for me. And so Jesus spent that, that 40 days telling them more and more about the kingdom. I think there's another reason, though, why Jesus spent 40 days with them. It's not in the text. It's, I, I, think it's, I think it's there, uh, but I think it's this one. To wean the disciples from depending on Jesus' physical presence. It was just about a month and a half or two months prior to this when Jesus tells his disciples the night he's betrayed, guys, I'm leaving, and where I'm going, you can't come. They hit the roof. They said, no way. There is no way you're leaving. Wherever you're going, we're going with you. No, you can't come with me where I'm going. And I think that Jesus had to spend those 40 days in his resurrected body, convincing them that he really has risen from the dead, teaching them more about the kingdom, but then also appearing and reappearing, reappearing and showing him that you need to learn to live without my physical presence In that same conversation that Jesus has with the disciples before he's crucified, he says, it's in your best interest. It's it's, it's good for you. It will be better for you that I go. And we'll talk more about that next Sunday. But that's the reason for the 40 days. The other question I have about this passage is this. What's with the cloud? Did you notice that in verse 9? It says in verse 9, Uh, And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Why a cloud? Why couldn't Jesus just float up without the cloud? What the significance of the cloud? I wish I could spend the entire sermon on the cloud, but I'm not going to. But I will say this. Keep in mind, and one of the things that we try to hit hard here at RK Church is that the Bible is one story with many episodes. I'm guessing during this pandemic and quarantine, you have probably binged on something on Prime or Disney or Netflix with your family. You've just gone through. And what that is, is one story with many episodes. The same is true for the story of the Bible. It is one story, many different episodes that contribute to that story. And the story of the Bible can be voiced many different ways, but I'll just say it this way. It is God's way of reconciling to himself sinful, hostile, rebellious people. And like I said, there's other ways to say that, but that's the main story of the Bible, is that God glorifying himself by redeeming, by reconciling his enemies to himself. But then there are different places in the Bible that talk about that. One of the things that we learn about God, mainly in the Old Testament, is that God is invisible, that anybody who sees God dies. But God wants to show himself present to his people. So how does he do that? Think back to the wilderness wandering in the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel wandering around in the desert, how did they know where to go? Because by day, there was a pillar of what? Cloud. That was God's presence leading them. He wanted them to see that he was present. When they, when they constructed this portable tabernacle and they, and they got it done and they got it ready to open for worship, what does the Bible say? A cloud descended upon the Holy of Holies. God wanted them to see that he's present with them. What happened when Solomon's temple was dedicated in 2 Chronicles? What happened there is said that a cloud engulfed the Holy of Holies. God wanted his people to see his presence with them. Fast forward to the New Testament when Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration and he appeared there with Elijah and Moses. What happened there? A cloud descended upon them. The disciples knew exactly what this was. That's why Luke says in chapter 24 of his gospel, the disciples walked away, even though they were saying goodbye to the physical presence of Jesus, they walked away with joy. Why? Why did they do that? Because they saw that Jesus' claims of being God were true. He was engulfed by God's presence himself. Now, now, 
we're talking about wrapping our minds around something. Wrap your mind around this. Jesus ascending in a cloud is the first time that a man has been in the presence of God since Adam was in the garden. A physical human being present with God since the garden. That to me is is huge. It is so significant. So what does the ascension mean today? Here, In a nutshell, here's what the ascension means today. There is a man with a certain height, a certain age, a certain look, a certain weight, who bears scars in his hands and his feet. And this physical human being is in the presence of God right now. See, the the ascension wasn't Jesus' spirit ascending. It was Jesus' physical body ascending into the presence of God. So think about this just for one moment. As you're listening to this, there is a physical person, a physical human being who has paid the ultimate sacrifice and won the ultimate victory, who is alive today, right now, somewhere else, Some say Idaho, I don't know. But he's alive somewhere else and he's doing things on our behalf. So I want to spend the rest of the time this morning just talking about that. But I want to talk about a a very general question. The big question is, where is he and what is he doing? Okay, if Jesus is alive and the Bible says that he is, he's physically alive, but he's somewhere else. The Bible says in heaven, In the presence of God, where is he? What is he doing? Well, here's the simple answer to this. The simple answer is exactly what we need him to do. Is Jesus sitting around this heavenly pool and his flip-flops and sunglasses, drinking a drink with an umbrella in it, waiting for the Father to make his move? Is that what he's doing? No, Jesus is active. He is doing things because we need him to do things. So if you're taking some notes, just write these things down. Jesus is active because we need him to be active. Number one, if you're taking notes, we need someone who can rule in our best interests. I know that this sounds somewhat self-centered, but let's face it. Those are the kinds of rulers that we want to follow. We want to follow someone that has our best interests in mind. In November, you and I are going to vote, and we will probably vote somehow for the candidate that we think has our best interests in mind. Now, who knows if they do or not? We can be really jaded and cynical about that, but the, but the bottom line is that's what we think. We, we, we want our best interest to be considered, and so we will probably vote for someone with that in mind. Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, he's talking, that's what happens to us. When we come to Christ, we too experience a resurrection of the soul. There will be a day when we'll have a resurrection of the body. But how about you? But experientially, that's very much what happened to me when I professed my faith in Christ, is that I, I became alive internally in a way that I wasn't before that. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Now, notice what he says there, seated at the right hand of God. What's that about? Well, we get a picture of this in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. This is one of my favorite pictures in the New Testament. Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purifications for sins. Now get this, it says here, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat down. Let me tell you why that's significant. I've got a picture here or a mock-up of the temple. This would be Herod's temple. This would be a a, a mock-up of Herod's temple, not Solomon's temple. But this is the temple that Jesus would have seen in his time. You look at this, and it's, it's huge. It's, it's humongous. And you look at this part, and you're thinking, 
Yeah, I know some churches that kind of look like that. And so you go in there, and what do you find? What, what you will not find anywhere inside this, behind this wall, you will not find any chair to sit down. No place to sit down. You'd think a place of worship would be like what we have at our facility where we have all kinds of places to sit down. Well, in the temple, no pew, no folding chair, nothing there for anyone to sit down. And yet there is constant around-the-clock activity inside this. There are priests doing things, cleaning things, changing the showbread, doing all different kinds of things. There is all kinds of activity going on within the temple. And the reason is because there is never a time when we are not sinning. And sin is continually having to be atoned for. And so the priest's work is always, always going on. It is never done. There is no place as they are doing their priestly duty for them to sit down because it's always going on. That's the significance of what Colossians 3 says and Hebrews chapter 1 say. Jesus Christ sat down. When he sat on the cross, it is finished that means that the priests no longer have to be active. All of this with the death of Jesus was rendered inactive, irre irrelevant. It didn't matter anymore. That's why the veil was ripped in two because no longer do people need to go through a veil. No longer do animals need to die. No longer do you need to cleanse your hands ceremonially because Jesus Christ has done everything. It's done, it's over, and now he sits down. It's over. He's, he's ruling now. He is the ruler who rules. That's what rulers do. They sit down. They are enthroned and they rule and they call the shots. That's why Paul says in chapter 3, verse 2, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Well, what do we set our minds on? We set our minds on this, that Jesus Christ and his work is done. He, it's not in the matter of doing. His work is done. So does that mean that he's inactive? No, it means that he's ruling. That he has set his authority over sin and over death, our two greatest enemies, and now he rules the entire world. That's why he said in Matthew 28, right before he ascends the Father, all authority has been given to me under heaven. And so all of this authority is there. And so we can rest. And the reason why we can rest is because he says in, in Colossians 3, 3 and 4, for you have died and your life is hidden. I love this phrase, don't you? Hidden with Christ. It's tucked away in the life of Christ where Christ begins and where you are finished. We don't know the line is blurred there because we are hidden in Christ. When Christ who is your life, when Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We'll talk about that last part in weeks to come. So what... What's the lesson here? I, I think the lesson is this. Because Jesus rules, we can trust his plan to make things right. During this pandemic, it looks like other forces are at play. It looks like everyone else is in control but Jesus. Our president, our governor, our legislators, our senators, our doctors. It looks like everybody else is in control and Jesus and us are out of control. Keep in mind, there was a day 2,000 years ago outside Jerusalem where it looked like that Jesus was the only person on the planet who was not in control. But three days later, we found out that just wasn't the case. During this time of crisis, it is important for us to talk to ourselves, not listen to ourselves, but talk to ourselves. Jesus rules. He is ruling with authority and all power. And so the issue for us as believers is not who's in charge, but rather are we going to follow the one who is in charge? Are we going to trust him? But then there's something else that we need with the ascension of Jesus, and, this is the, and that's this. We need someone who understands the life we live. We need someone who understands the life we live. I want you to imagine this. Imagine that you have been accused of doing a despicable crime. It doesn't matter, just pick a crime. You've been thrown into jail, and right now you are in dire need of legal counsel. 
and a lawyer has been appointed to you, and the lawyer comes into your cell, the door closes behind, and it's just you and your lawyer in this cell. And as you talk and as you get to know this lawyer, you, you begin to find out that this lawyer has, understands completely where you're coming from. He understands the crime that you've committed because he was accused of that as well. And you find out that this lawyer is so sympathetic and identifying with you in all different aspects. It's just so wonderful to be able to find that this person understands everything that you're going through. Do you realize that there is a person with a real height, a real weight, with a real face, with real hair, scars in his hands, his feet, his side, who understands completely what you're experiencing right now. The writer of Hebrews helps us out a little bit with this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 and on. The writer of Hebrews says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens Jesus, the Son of God. He wants to make sure that we understand who the high priest is. Now, I understand that we don't use high priest a whole lot. The reason why we don't is because we already have one. We have one in Jesus. Let us, because this is true, because this is true, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Understand the, implica- uh, the implications of Jesus being our high priest. Let us hold fast to our confession. We can, hold, we can assure that Jesus being our high priest, we know that this is the right high priest. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us. We have someone who understands. He's been in the cell with us. He understands our weaknesses. He understands our issues. He understands our problems but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. And this is where a a while ago I would be saying, okay, whatever, writer of Hebrews, um, I get it. But the bottom line is, I mean, let's face it, Jesus, Jesus was playing, he lived life with a stacked deck. He was perfect. He's a son of God. He's the Messiah. That, that must mean that his battle with sin is not as intense as mine is because, because I, don't, I, I, I don't think he can sympathize with the, with the battle with temptation that I battle with. I don't think that he can understand exactly what I'm going through when it comes to these kinds of things. I just don't buy it. I used to think that. I used to, I used to minimize this passage thinking that Jesus... Uh, that's really great. It's, it's wonderful. It's a hallmark moment. But the truth is, the battle I have with temptation is so intense, there's no possible way that a perfect human being could understand the battle I have. Turns out that C.S. Lewis has helped me understand this a little bit. I've got this quote from Mere Christianity. I highly recommend during this pandemic you read it. It's a great book. This is what he says about this. No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. I'm going to read that again. I just think that's so well said. No man knows how bad he is till he has tried very hard to be good. A silly idea is current that good people do not know what temptation means. This is an obvious lie. Only those who try to resist temptation know how strong it is. After all, you find out the strength of the German army by fighting against it, not by giving in. A man who gives in to temptation after five minutes simply does not know what it would have been like an hour later. That is why bad people, in one sense, know very little about badness. They have lived a sheltered life by always giving in. We never find out the strength of the evil impulse inside us until we try to fight it. And Christ, because he was the only man who never yielded to temptation, is also the only man who knows to the full what temptation means. The complete realist. So when we say that there's no way that Jesus can identify with the temptations that I have, In a way, that's true because the temptation he faced was far more intense than whatever I face. And the reason why this truth is significant 
It's because right now, in heaven, there is a physical man with a certain weight and a certain height, certain hair color, scars in his hands and feet and side that understands completely your experience and mine. He understands the worry, the anxiety, the temptation that you are facing every moment of every day. So what's the lesson? Here's the lesson. Because Jesus understands the life we live, we are never alone. Because he is alive somewhere and he is ruling over us, this ruler understands. I, I don't know what you think about President Trump. Don't know, don't care. But I do know this, there is no way that President Trump can, can, can be able to sympathize with a homeless person. There's no way that anyone of wealth could ever sympathize, any ruler could sympathize with a homeless person the way that Jesus Christ can sympathize, can empathize, and identify with you and with me. The beauty of this reality is this. Jesus is physically alive and he is somewhere ruling over us. And as he rules over us and he sees you fall under temptation, he does not come along and says, what? Porn? Seriously? Alcohol? Come on. I had so much greater temptations than that and I was perfect. And so you've got to be what I was. If I could overcome sin, you can overcome sin. Come on, let's go, let's go. You've got to stop sinning and try harder. I love a trier and so you've got to get going. That is not the Jesus who has ascended to the Father. He is our high priest who sympathizes with us. He understands he has been tempted far greater in greater depths than you or I, and that is not to rub our nose in our failures, but rather to say, I understand what you're going through. And he understands right now. This is not someday in the future. It is right now. This resurrected, ascended king ruling over us understands He understands and he sympathizes with what we are going through. And I I love that. That my king is not saying, you've got to obey the rules. And if you don't obey the rules, you're out of my kingdom. Barabbas says, no, come, come on in. I get it. I understand your struggles. I understand your pain. I understand every aspect that you're facing. And you can trust me because I have overcome what you, are, what you are doing. And I will overcome, and you will overcome those things in me, but not by yourself. You need me as your high priest. Then the third thing that we need, that's very important that we need, we need someone to speak on our behalf. Go back to that jail cell where the lawyer's meeting with you in the jail cell. And you're loving the fellowship. You're loving the fact that this this, this lawyer that is in the jail cell with you understands and sympathizes with your situation. You are so grateful to have this person beside you. But after about three or four hours of conversation, you're kind of thinking to yourself, "Um, I'm really glad you're here with me. I really am. I'm really glad that you sympathize with me but shouldn't you be in the courtroom defending me? Speaking to the judge on my behalf? I mean, isn't that what lawyers do? That is exactly what Jesus Christ is doing right now. He's ruling, he's sympathizing, and he's speaking, he's defending, he's advocating on our behalf. Romans chapter 8 um, I look for opportunities to always insert this into sermons. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. He is speaking to the Father on our behalf. Why? Because he is the one who died. He is the one who was condemned. He is the one who rose and our life is hidden with him. And at this very moment, think about this. 
at this very moment, and I don't know how it works. Someday we will, but right now, I don't have a clue. But right now, right now, there is this person, this physical person with a certain height and a certain weight, certain hair color, certain complexion, with scars in his hands and his feet and his side, and he is speaking to the Father, to the judge on your behalf, saying, Father, you can accept them. They're in me. And so as you look at me, you can see them. They have placed their faith in me to save them. And because of my work on the cross, they are no longer guilty of sin because I paid for that guilt. I think that that's huge, especially during times of pandemic. Think think about this. Go back to the image of the temple. This, This whole thing right here, this whole part, it was built. I mean, it took years to build, but it was built really for one day of the year. One day. Now, our, our campus at RK Church, it was built primarily to be, to be uh, occupied 52 days out of the year. Lord willing, it will be occupied even more here in the next few months, I hope, I pray, someday. But this, this, this wasn't built for Saturday or Sunday. This was built for one day called the Day of Atonement. Built for that. And what would happen is the high priest out of the tribe of Levi would go into the temple court and through this gate and there he would wash his hands in a basin symbolizing his own sins, that he is a sinful person too. The high priest is sinful. He would wash his hands And then he'd walk over to an animal, a living animal, like a lamb or an oxen. And he would place his hands on the animal, this animal that's never done done anything wrong. He would place his hands on the animal to symbolize a transfer of sin. So he's taking his sin and he's the high priest of the entire nation of Israel. And so he's taking the sins of the entire nation on his hands and he's putting them on the animal saying that the sins of the high priest and the sins of the animal have been transferred and the sins of Israel have been transferred to this animal. It's weird, I know. It's, it's beyond our wildest imagination, but that's what God commanded in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. So he places his hands on the animal and then they kill the animal. This animal that's done Nothing wrong. It is completely innocent of anybody's sins, let alone their own. And yet the sins of the people is transferred to this animal and then it dies. Why? Because that's the penalty of sin, is death. The high priest, and I'm cutting it way short here, but the high priest then takes some blood of that innocent animal and he walks into this holy place of the Holy of Holies, this building right here. And there was a veil there. That's the veil that was torn in two when Jesus died on the cross. The veil is in this large room. And he goes behind the veil, which was the symbolic presence of God. And there the high priest would be met with the Ark of the Covenant. Maybe you've heard of that before. And on the Ark of the Covenant was a seat. Nobody sat there, but that was the symbolic presence of God. And the high priest would take blood and sprinkle it on the seat. That seat had a name. It was called mercy, the mercy seat. Thus making blood atonement for the sins of the nation of Israel. This is what Jesus has done on the cross. He has stood in the place of Israel He has borne the brunt of sin of the world upon himself. And now he intercedes. He is the legal counsel for us. We have been declared not guilty. We have been declared innocent of all charges because of the work of Jesus Christ. And so he stands before the Father and he makes intercession for you and for me. This consummate lawyer is defending us as Satan, as his demonic his demonic hordes, even sometimes our own souls condemn us. There is Jesus speaking on our behalf. And so when we hear about Jesus and what he's doing right now, he's not somewhere else. 
but rather he is speaking on our behalf. And here, here's the lesson. Because Jesus is our advocate, we need not fear the judge. I love, again, how the writer of Hebrews says it in chapter 4, verse 16. Because we need not fear the judge, we don't just go about our daily lives as if nothing ever happened. Because we need not fear the judge, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. The reason why we can go to the throne of grace with confidence is because Jesus took on our sin. He became our high priest. Instead of him killing an animal and using that blood, he allowed himself to be killed as a sacrificial lamb. And his blood was seen before the Father and it was accepted. And so now we can approach our Father with great confidence, knowing that there we will receive grace, mercy to help us in our time of need. Are you in a time of need? I am. There's stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff going on that's very, very scary. And so what we can do about this is that we can be able to go before our Father and we need not rely on our obedience in the presence of God. I want this, I want, again, I'm using this a lot, I want your mind to wrap around this truth. You going into the presence of God he does not demand that you have a perfect record. You need not wait until you've obeyed for a week, then you go to God. I've heard dozens of times, I don't really want to go to God, I've got to work on me first. You've missed the whole gospel. The whole gospel is that God will accept you because of Christ, not because of you. This is a beautiful thing. We talked about the birth, the death, and the resurrection. Those are the things that Jesus has done. The ascension is all about what Jesus is doing. There is never a time in Christ when you go before the throne of grace where God says, yeah, you've been way too bad. Get out of my presence. There is never a time like that. So you never have to worry about mustering up your performance or mustering up your obedience to go into his presence. And on the flip side, you need not think that his blessing is because you've been good. If things are clicking on all cylinders and life is great, you need not think, well, it's because I've been behaving. But then you need not think when things are going poorly, and for a lot of us they are, that you've been behaving badly. This is God who rules, and he is ruling through his son, Jesus Christ, and this wonderful ruler sympathizes with us. And intercede, because of that, he intercedes on our behalf because his blood sacrifice was acceptable to God. So now you and I, during times of crisis, of pandemic, where we just don't know what's going to happen when this is all over, or if it ever gets over, we need not worry because we have this ruler who identifies with us. And we can be able to go in the presence of God and thoroughly be met with acceptance and love. So just real quick to review, because Jesus rules, we can trust his plan to make things right. Because Jesus understands the life we live, we are never alone. Because Jesus is our advocate, we need not fear the judge. I, I, I so desperately want this to sink into my own heart, but certainly into yours as well. Because these truths, I'll tell you right now, for me, these, truth, these truths are like an asthmatic inhaler. They help me breathe. They help me, they help me get grounded and anchored deep in the truths of God. They allow me to, to rise above what I see, what I hear in the news source, what I'm experiencing with friends and family, with loss of wages, loss of jobs, finances, it can absolutely go, we can go crazy. But the truth of Jesus Christ allows us to rise above those and allows us to breathe the clear air of his love and his mercy over us. I, I, uh, last Sunday after our online service, 
I, went, I went for a bike ride on the American River Trail. I think the American River Trail is probably one of the best kept secrets in Sacramento. I love it there. I've gone on it hundreds of times. I know every inch of it, just about. And so Sunday, I was going to get into a quick, a quick bike ride. Didn't have a lot of time, but I went out for a couple of hours. And I, I go down Garfield to Fair Oaks, and I go through the neighborhoods and get on the bike trail at William Pond Park. And uh, I get on the trail, and I swear, it was like I-80 at quitting time. I mean, there were people everywhere. I, I've been on it when it's super crowded. I have never seen it so crowded as this. Typically, I don't want to have to weave in around crowds, and so I would have turned around and found another route to go for a ride. But I, maybe because even as an introvert, I want to be around people. And so I decided to go on the trail, and it was just constant people. It was this thoroughfare of people. And the beautiful thing was, it was families. There were, there were grandmas and grandpas and aunts and uncles and moms and dads and teenagers and, and middle schoolers and toddlers and everyone was smiling and there were tricycles and little bikes with, with training wheels and it was just really great. I couldn't stop grinning just seeing these families. And this one episode, there was this little boy, probably, I don't know, probably five or six years old and clearly, clearly, he was learning how to ride the bike and his dad was right behind him pushing him and the dad was smiling, saying, hey, I got you, I got you, I got you. And the little boy was pedaling, thinking he's got it, he's got it, he's got it. And he is just smiling like he's learning how to fly. And in his mind, he probably is. And the thing that made me pause, in fact, I slowed down just to watch. You probably thought I was kind of creepy, but, but I just watched because I just love this little boy. He was dressed in his Spider-Man costume. And it was just great because Spider-Man's my favorite superhero, and I'll wrestle you for it because he's the best. And I was just grinning and seeing this and seeing these children. All of them were grinning and smiling and laughing and having a wonderful, throwing rocks in the river and, and darting around, chasing squirrels. It was a wonderful sight to see all of these Sacramentans enjoying the beauty of the American River Trail. And it dawned on me, and I knew I was going to be preaching this series. As I saw all of these children just loving life, loving that moment, I had this thought, I wonder if this little boy or that little girl understands the burden of mom and dad and what they're carrying right now. I know what's going on. That mom and dad, they have probably had cut wages or they've lost their jobs. They've had to wait in line at unemployment. Maybe they've already spent their, their uh, incentive check from the government and they don't know what's going to happen. And yet there they are, and that little boy, that little girl, they are just smiling, oblivious to what is going on. And yet mom and dad are there making sure that their children are smiling and loving life and enjoying that moment. There's a couple of different applications with that. The first one is, may you do that. May you enjoy those moments. Mom and dad, I know that you are facing some very big decisions in your life, a lot of stress. And you want your children, you want to shelter your kids from that stress. Who's going to shelter you? Jesus, who rules, the ascended Lord, who has a real body with a real height and a real weight, with real scars in his hands and his feet, who sympathizes with you and rules over you. You can trust him because he is constantly interceding to the Father on your behalf. That's what Jesus is doing right now. But then I got to thinking too, there's another application. And I just want to throw this out to you. There's all kinds of talk about what life is going to look like when the quarantine is lifted and how things are going to be different. They're going to be different in my life because I'm going, to, I'm going to turn over some things and I'm going, to, I'm going to change some things. And that's really great. I think that's very important that you think about what your life is going to be like when the quarantine is lifted. What I'd like you to think about is right now, while the quarantine is here, because we have no clue when this is going to be lifted. And this is where I'd like to introduce to you just another hashtag. Hashtag is the end thing. I want to challenge you with this hashtag. Not wasting my waiting. While we wait for the quarantine to be lifted, I want to challenge you, don't waste this time. Because here's the thing, moms and dads, 
you have more family time than you've ever had before that your children have been born probably. No sports going on. No, no dates, no going out to a movie and dinner, uh, no proms, no events like that. It's pretty much, you know what, the kids do the homework in the daytime and the night is wide open. And what I'm hearing from our parents is they're going for walks, maybe the American River bike trail. They're, 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 they're playing board games like Monopoly or Risk or Racco. They're, they're, going, they're, they're eating dinner together as a family. What? What is that? They're doing all of these things as a family. Could it be that the Jesus who rules over us is saying, this is what is important. This is the life that I want you to live now. And you weren't learning this before, so now learn this. And that's what I'd like to introduce to you, not wasting my waiting, is share with us stories of things that you are doing as a family, not to brag about it, but to encourage us. We're not wasting. We're not waiting for the quarantine to be lifted to get back to normal. We are not going to waste our waiting now. We are, we are taking advantage of this time together, eating dinner together, putting the phones away, playing board games, going on walks, maybe watching a Netflix or Prime or Disney together as a family. How great would that be? Why? Why can we do that? Because we can be like those children on the American River bike trail. We are just smiling. Why? Because we have someone ruling over us. He is ruling over us and he loves us and he knows far more what we're going through even than we do. And he is kind and he intercedes on our behalf. That is what the ascended Jesus is doing now. Let's not waste our waiting. Let's pray. Lord God, help us with this. It, it's hard enough to, to contemplate the reality of the resurrection, but then to add to that, that there is this man who lives right now in your presence, interceding on our behalf, sympathizing with us, ruling over us. By faith, we trust you. We love you. We thank you for what you've done. You did it. And we glory in what you've done. We pray these things in the holy name of Christ, our ascended Savior. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another that together with one voice you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you. And we all say together, for the glory of God. Have a great day. I love you. What a great morning worshiping and learning the truth of the scriptures together, Arcade Church. You know, if, if today is the first time that you are really following Jesus with belief and trust in who he is, would you send us a message? Text us at 484848, the words Arcade Follow, and we will be in touch with you ASAP. Also, don't forget, let us know how you're spending your waiting. Here's our hashtag, not wasting my waiting. We can't wait to see what you guys are up to. Look forward to seeing you throughout the week. Take care.